they found statistically significant improvement with high pulse pressure, but not for medium or low pulse pressure. Hi there, I'm Dr. Kevin Leach here with the Chiropractic Deep Dive Podcast, bringing you the most important research and information on conservative primary spine care, upper cervical chiropractic care, and traditional chiropractic care. These research reviews, interviews, and episodes are made for you, whether you're a medical doctor, patient, or concerned family member or friend. The goal of these shows is to bring awareness of the importance of taking care of our spine and the impact it has on our health and the hundreds of different health conditions it could cause without us realizing it. I'm really trying to bring value with these, so I'd appreciate commenting on the videos, hitting the like button, and sharing them with as many people as you can. You never know who might need to see it. And consider subscribing to the channel so you can see all the other episodes and videos coming out. Thank you so, so much. I truly appreciate your support. Now on to the show. Okay, welcome back to the Upper Cervical Chiropractic Research Show. This is episode 20. I am Dr. Kevin Leach, and here with me once again is my good friend, Dr. Tyler Evans. How are you, sir? Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you, as always. All right, so today is, like I said, number 20, and this is Pulse Pressure Findings Following Upper Cervical Care, a Practiced-Based Observational Study. Uh, by Robert Kessinger, Trevor Qualls, John Hart, Henri Dalius, Michael Anderson, Jared Whalen, and Leldon Bradshaw. And this is in the Journal of, of the Canadian Chiropractic Association. It's cool to see a lot of those authors are a lot of those are a lot of good friends and, the, and people that we know. That's pretty cool. Um, okay, so just to kind of review the paper, uh, just to give a real quick over, overview. The goal of the paper is to identify pulse pressure, which is the difference between uh, the top number and bottom number, systolic and diastolic, uh, and to identify the pulse pressure change for patients undergoing upper cervical chiropractic care for six weeks. They're looking for uh, what role the upper cervical spine plays with the autonomic nervous system regulation of the cardiovascular system. Uh, patients were part of one of three groups, high pulse pressure, medium pulse pressure, and low pulse pressure. They found statistically significant improvement with high pulse pressure, but not for medium or low pulse pressure. So what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Evans? Well, one, uh, this paper is a pretty well done paper. It's 139 patients, I think, 130, 139 patients, something like that. Um, so it's a, a fair fairly good sized chunk of people. And we're measuring a statistic that is indicative of adaptation in the nervous system and flexibility in the cardiovascular system, which in terms of like what we're doing uh, is really um, conservative, but headed down a proactive, very wellness-based approach to having a better uh, cardiovascular system, having, you know, avoiding blood pressure medications, avoiding, uh, you know, all kinds of medications that you might be put on. There's a few different ways you can monitor this. And uh, um, the, the gentleman uh, that is the third person down on the list is by the name of John Hart who I've had a, had a few good conversations with. He's probably one of the, the most published, right behind Gary Knudsen um, of, of uh, upper cervical people. And he is a, was a professor at Sherman Chiropractic College for like a long time. And I think he's produced something like 30 or 40 papers, um, but a lot of them have to do with HRV. And so his focus is on how do we find these predictors of health? And that's, I'm pretty sure, I don't know the whole story behind this paper, but I've talked with John a few times and I know Rob, Dr. Kessinger pretty well and, and heard him speak. And I actually heard Dr. Kessinger speak on this paper at the Colorado ICA Upper Cervical Symposium in 2019. So I'm pretty familiar with it, but um, the, the whole idea is like good health 
predictors like wellness, pr proactive healthcare approach, and pulse pressure is one. Also, just um, heart rate and, and pulse are good ways to measure health predict. It's a good predictor of health. You know, if you have good numbers, generally uh, we're going to be healthy. And so this is one way to show that chiropractic increases your body's ability to adapt to its environment and your body to be healthy. And that's, that's what he's going after here. And it seems like he showed that with those patients that were, had that, that larger difference. That means those are poor predictors of health. And we altered that by inter intervening and, and having an intervention. And uh, yeah, break it down. Can you just review just a real basic step-by-step -step of why the, the chiropractic adjustment, especially in the upper cervical spine, leads to hmm. um, an improvement of that pulse pressure? Just real basic. That could be one of two or three different things. But um, what I would say is uh, number one, <clears throat> we're talking about proprioception into the cervical spine. There are baroreceptors within the carotid arteries that basically the, the skull is a vault of fluid and the brain needs a exact right amount of blood in and out of the skull. So basically all, the, all, all, all day long, all, all, your whole life, your brain needs oxygen. If it doesn't have oxygen, you die quickly, right? You start to shut down, things go dark. So you, your heart is working all day long to keep blood into your brain and then your extremities and your gut, but most importantly, your brain. So there are tons of receptors in the neck about blood flow into the skull and out of the skull. If the neck is out of alignment, that blood flow can be restricted and altered. And so correcting the alignment of the neck, we've seen with the Nuka Bakra study, uh, the blood pressure study, look that one up. We can always do a video on it. Uh, that showed changes in, in blood pressure, quite uh, dramatic, uh, very good changes there. And, and so we're just seeing those changes based on probably the baroreceptors, probably, and, and there's a couple other studies that I can, I, that can back me up on that, but um, the autonomic nervous system is the way that that would be regulated through the ANS, which is a branch of the um, peripheral. Jeez, I'm on the spot here and I'm like forgetting. What, uh, it's a central nervous system, isn't it? Yeah, it's central, it's central yeah. nervous system. Yeah, it's CNS. Yeah. So anyways, autonomic nervous system, fight or flight, and um, that system is constantly balancing back and forth to keep blood flow up, get it down if it's too high, back and forth. And when the neck is out of alignment, it actually alters the input in that system because the sympathetics are mostly in the cervical spine and actually right at C1 and C2. And that's actually in the spinal spinal cord. So, so what, um, what is the reason why the pulse pressure actually had a statistical improvement for the high, but not the medium or low? I mean, yeah, I was kind of just leading, leading you there, but I was thinking yeah. as far as it would make sense. And one of the things that I, that I tell my patients when they come in with a problem and they say, oh, I've heard upper cervical has helped it or nuke has helped it or whatever. They, uh, they say, Hey, well, can you help me? And it's like, well, we've helped a lot of people before. And I always come down to saying, if the misalignment is creating the problem, I mean, it's, it's super simple, but it's, it's not what we're taught from commercials, et cetera. And just the, uh, the idea of healthcare in the country still today, but if the misalignment is causing the problem and we fix it, then it's going to correct the problem or it's going to get your body optimally functioning to correct the problem as, as much as possible um, with, you know, minus whatever permanent damage has been done. So for me, it would make sense that since that, since the high range of the pulse pressure has been shown in studies to have more you know, cardiovascular risk, et cetera. Obviously that's sort of a disease process. So to see that range 
come back to it down to what is considered a normal and healthy range makes sense that it wouldn't happen for a medium or a low because it's almost like that's already in a somewhat healthy range. So if they had a misalignment, that misalignment wasn't affecting that part of the cardiovascular system. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's like the the high uh, high outliers there, the, those those big difference patients were um, pa pathologic, and the other ones aren't, and and they're just the other ones are adapting, and they're not out of that big range. And and if you have a big misalignment, you know you're going to have a probably a larger effect on the cardiovascular system that, you know, we can talk about it just real briefly, but 20% goes through the uh, uh, vertebral arteries and 80% goes through the carotids. You can imagine that, you know, if you have those, those kind of moderate patients or those low level patients, they're able to balance between the cervical spine and the, and then and the vertebral arteries and the carotid arteries. But if you have a big misalignment, uh, you're losing that 20% in the vertebrals, and then you're relying on that that other 80%, which is is big, but you know that can create a big difference. So that might be it. Yeah, cool. Maybe. That was going to be another question of mine, as far as besides the you know the Dickholt study, the, the 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 hypertension study you were just talking about. Do you and they mentioned some in here in the citations that I didn't get a chance to look at, but do you know of any more? significant studies with the cardiovascular system with upper cervical? Yeah. So the, the study on rats actually, and when we talk, that's why rats are used in uh, biology in labs is because their physiology anatomy is <clears throat> very similar to humans. They respond similar to humans more than any other animal. F ferrets uh, have the most similar respiratory, which is why they get used for um, virus uh, research, and I don't want to get on a tangent there, but um, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, stay, we'll stay close to the close to home on this one. But so the deal is, is that mice and rats, uh, they have a similar cervical spine structure and they actually have similar arteries and, uh, and the skull fluid differences, hydrodynamics, I guess is the word I'm going, spinal cranial hydrodynamics. And so uh, what they actually did, unfortunately, was they they misaligned the cervical spine of these rats. I forget where it was done. I have to, we, we can review the paper another day, um, but uh, they misaligned these rats with, I think they put a staple into their neck and actually held the bone out of place with like a staple, a piece of metal. Um, and you, they x-rayed them and you could see that the bones were out of, out of alignment and it actually immediately showed changes in blood pressure and then they took the, the uh, metal piece out and the bone went back and their blood pressure came back to normal. So, um, and that was in the cervical spine. So we know that the cervical spine and maybe not even necessarily the atlas or C1 or C2, but, but they were talking about the, uh, the upper area and, uh, and how the sympathetics are located up there. So yeah, there's some other studies. There's, there's probably a lot. Those are just, that's what I know, so. Cool. And I think it's a good idea to define the ranges of the yeah. what, what's considered normal, medium, and then high. And so 40. So if you have 120 over 80, that's 40. That would be considered ideal. Um, anywhere, a, a difference between the top and the, and the bottom number of uh, 40 to 49 is medium. And I think they might have had some decent changes there, but nothing statistically significant. But it's the ones that are greater than 49 that had the improvement. So for anybody watching this, if, you're, if you happen to be um, a, a patient or a lay person and not a, a, a geeky doctor like us going over this research, um, and you have, or if you know somebody with a difference of the systolic and diastolic uh, blood pressure of over 49, you might be a great candidate for care. And so seeking some upper cervical care could actually potentially um, help or manage this, you know, you know, this, this difference here, this pulse pressure without the use of drugs uh, or, you know, or pharmaceutical means. So that might be a good idea for anyone with that to, to, to seek out some upper cervical care. Mm-hmm.
Yeah. Now here's a question. What would you, uh, what would you like to see? What kind of study would you like to see in regards to, you know, there's some pretty good evidence here. So what would be like the next step to really kind of, you know, show that, you know, this could really upper cervical chiropractic care could really be uh, a, a great, you know, either management or, you know, solution for, for people with hypertension, with high pulse pressure, et cetera. I don't want to get too deep on this, but uh, when Dr. Dick Holtz published his study back in 2008, I believe, or 2007, mm -hmm. um, when he published that study, the NIH, they actually, they, they got the attention of the NIH because the, the Dr. Bacris and the blood pressure center of Chicago or something, I don't know, it was a big uh, medical center there in Chicago. They, they got behind it because they were like, this is cool. We're seeing some really good conservative care results. And, you know, we're getting people off medication, blood pressure medication. And it can be quite harmful. Um, and so anyways, we got the attention of the NIH. We got a million dollar grant. It went to Palmer and I'm not going to, I don't want to get us in trouble here, but uh, basically they did another study with um, another technique and different practitioners and it didn't turn out so good. And basically we lost the funding and there it went. <clears throat> now I would say that it wasn't done with good upper cervical care. That's my opinion. Um, I don't know if you know about that, that whole situation. Uh, I can show you that paper later, but there is a paper about that. Um, so anyways, um, going forward, we need to do larger studies on this with good clinicians. We need to do it with, you know, proficient clinicians who have gone through uh, training and certification processes in, in upper cervical organizations that are, have good standards. And that's, I think, what we need to do. We need to do it on a scale of, you know, 1,000, 10,000 patients over a course of six months to a year to five years. Uh, because if we can show that, and, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of money out there, and it's just getting the attention the right way. So, you know, Dr. Backris and Dr. Dickholz got the attention, but it needs to be done again. This is 139 patients. They showed a really good result. Uh, we need to we need to run with that and and do more with it and that's that's always the issue right not enough money not enough time but uh, and, and then IRB and you run into trouble with oh well you know are you doing your blinding properly are you are you you know can you do actually do this with patients is it is it legal is it are you breaking standards of care and all that stuff so it's just getting it, getting it done properly. It's tricky. Got it. Yeah. I completely agree. Cool. All right. Any last thoughts on the paper? I've got a, another fun question for the day. How many, oh, yay. how many horses does Dr. Evans have or his uh, amazing uh, Blair practitioner wife, uh, Dr. Michael Beebe, how many horses do they have let's cue the jeopardy the time of the, the the recording do 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 at the recording of this uh video we have two, we have two. <laughs> awesome. that number may grow <laughs> yeah now um what do you do with the horses just you just ride them and you just have them and yeah it's, it's like it's like having um, a pet you uh, you clean up their poop. <laughs> we call them hay, hay burners. They just go through hay. <laughs> you feed them hay and they poop it out. <laughs> no, it's great. You know we uh, we have um, we have two horses and they're both uh, they're they're both made to uh, to jump uh, and do what my wife likes to do is called uh, eventing, which is that's called three day eventing. So you have uh, dressage, which is where they walk around in, in a sand pit uh, in pretty circles and do, you know, like trot, jog, walk. And then uh, the next step is to do uh, jumping inside of the arena in that sand pit. And they, they go over little jumps and make a, make a, like a figure eight and, and go through it in different directions. And then lastly, they do cross country, which is uh, very uh, exciting and a little bit dangerous when I'm watching my wife do this, but they're, you know, at a full out pace going as fast as they can and jumping over obstacles out like out on a course in the woods and big fields. So um, that's what, uh, that's what we do. And awesome. 
it's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for the episode, and uh, yeah, so we'll see you we'll see you on the next one. Okay, sounds right. good. Right. Hey, that's it for this episode. So what did you learn that fascinated you or surprised you about the research today? Join or start the conversation in the comments below. Hey, thanks so much for watching. To watch more of our research shows, click or tap the screen right there. To subscribe to the channel, click or tap the screen right there. Until next time, I'm Dr. Kevin Leach with the Upper Cervical Chiropractic Research Show bringing awareness to conservative primary spine care, upper cervical chiropractic care, and traditional chiropractic. Until next time, take care and take care of your spine. It's the only one you'll ever have.